kind of endless dialogue uh, and trying to optimize the best spacecraft for a particular utilization. If you do it right, you save your company billions of dollars. So it's important to understand all of these things. Now, where do these disturbances from our pristine two body problem come from? Well, one of the disturbances is from a third body. And so one of the other bodies in the solar system, let's rank it from most influential to least influential. What's the thing for Earth orbit satellites that's going to disturb the orbit the most? The moon, the moon, the moon. It's not the biggest object in the solar system, but it's by far the closest. So the moon, which is 385,000 kilometers from Earth, radius centroid to centroid. What's the next thing? What's the next body in the solar system that's going to influence Mars? Not quite, no. The sun, the sun. The sun is 150,000 kilometers, oh, excuse me, 150 million kilometers, much farther than the near moon, but of course much, much more massive. And so that's why uh, it comes in as a close number, set, uh, number two. A close second to the moon. When it lacks in distance, it overcomes its sheer mass. What's the third thing in the universe? Or in the solar system? In the universe. It influences and tugs and, and tugs. Beautiful, perfect circular, uh, circular and elliptical orbit, it's out of whack. The third thing. Not Mars. Mars is chasing you. It's tiny. What's the next biggest thing in the solar system? Jupiter. Jupiter. And then everything else is kind of in the noise. Usually it comes to much enough where you can ignore even the three big ones in this order for most big satellites. If you start going to space missions, it's usually you know, these two things. And depending on where you are in the unit, the solar system, the public or swap order of importance. And Jupiter is almost, it's, it's not as massive as the sun, it's farther away, but it's almost like its own star. People who study planetary, planetary and solar system formation suggest that uh, uh, Jupiter is a would be star, and a lot of stars are binary. In nature, in other words, solar systems of other places are, are two or three stars, and we have a uh, single star system, which is not unheard of, but uh, quite often there's another object that turns into a star. Jupiter just didn't quite make it in our solar system. Didn't quite make it. Okay. Now, this is a source of perturbation for Earth faces that like other bodies. There's another source of perturbation, and that is actually the Earth itself. There are two types of irregularities about the Earth itself that influence the satellite orbits. One is the shape of the Earth. The Earth is actually not a perfect sphere. It is what scientists call an oblate spheroid. And that is a fancy word for a pair. I don't know if I got from space because the, the disturbances are minor. Okay. If you just visually look at it from space at a distance, it looks like a sphere. But it's not perfect. It's, it's actually a little bit bigger at the bottom than it is at the top, just slightly. And you would think that that would make a difference. But if you put a satellite up there for 10 years, and you let the air accumulate day after day after day, you'll actually notice a difference. I'm not going to say an open spheroid is put up a perfect sphere. Yes. Oh, the south, yes, southern hemisphere. One of the more vast down there is the southern hemisphere. Strange that that makes you count something. Yeah, as a percentage of the mass of the Earth, it's not that significant. But, you know, even a... Which, if the Earth is 10, 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms, you know, a few hundred trilogra- trillion kilograms here or there doesn't make a much of a difference in absolute sense, but it will actually distort the gravitational pull slightly with errors that will build up over time. So, Earth irregularities. And the other irregularity is something called mascons. Mascons are regions on the Earth that have different densities. So, for example, Let's take a look at the polar view of the Earth. So this is the North Pole. We're looking down at the North Pole. The Earth is spinning this way. But in absolute space, if we ignore the rotation of the Earth, and this is something that is really only important for geostationary Earth orbit satellites, the mascots. Why? Because those are, uh, they they need to maintain exact synchronization with the rotation of the Earth. And they need to have the same uh, alignment with the latitude of the Earth that they started on. And over time, even slight changes, we're going to see they're moving in a thousand kilometers per second, right? And so, in human part, even a slight error, like half a meter per second, tilts into your velocity. Over time, that's how it will drift out of its design. Uh, 
launches you and places in the sky. And it'll lose the whole reason why you launch because you have to share Earth orbit satellite to begin with. And so there are, because you're phase launching the Earth, so if you were in a lower Earth orbit satellite, this wouldn't be a big deal for a lot of reasons. First of all, you're always moving, so you're going to have to deal with some tracking anyway, right? Secondly, you're moving around and around the Earth, and whenever irregularities are on the Earth, we'll kind of cancel each other out over time. Now, true for the geostationary Earth with the satellite, because you see the same part of the Earth all the time. So if there's an irregularity, a higher density region on one part of the surface of the Earth than the other, over time, that irregularity will build error up into your orbit. orbit. And so it turns out that there are actually two stable points regions of high-density mass gods that attract the geostationary Earth orbit satellite, and the two unstable points. Let me just write where they are. The unstable points are at 162 degrees longitude and 348 degrees. These are unstable points. And then 75 degrees and 252 degrees. These are stable points. And we're going to talk on this in terms of uh, longitudes, so 360 degrees and 0 degrees, this would be Greenwich, England, roughly. And so over here you have North America, here's North America, here's like Central Asia, India, Pacific Ocean, okay, Europe over here. Europe and the Pacific Ocean, very repulsive. North America, Central Asia, attractive. Right. I'm just kidding. So that's where the stable and unstable points are. If you have a geostationary Earth orbit satellite here, over time, it will slowly, without any correction, start to drift over to this stable point. You find the satellite. If it's over here, it moves this way. If it's over here, it moves this way. It'll probably oscillate many times. For this way, if it's over here, everything will start to approach that stable point over there. They have left to their own devices. Over the course of many centuries, you would develop these two giant trash flows over the Earth, where all the dead satellites would accumulate. But obviously, we don't see that. So, as part of an international agreement, if you launch a geostationary Earth on a satellite, before the satellite dies, you need to make sure there's enough station heating fuel to launch it into something called a graveyard orbit. And so, now you only need to go about, I don't know, 200 kilometers beyond geostationary Earth orbit. There's no drag up there, so you're going to stay in that orbit and be going And that piece of space junk will have just enough motion faster, uh, slower than the surface of the Earth so that all the mascots will integrate on it and it won't fall into the, those stable points. So if you want to shift the air over, you must, uh, so like you must make sure there's enough space to keep it fuel and put it in that graveyard with it. Any questions about that so far? Okay. Now, a couple other things to keep in mind. We talk about the extra bodies that influence the um, tug and pull of satellites in orbit. I said earlier, we had a good, really good question earlier. Well, you know, are all the things in the solar system lined up on a plane? Like the planets all operate on the same plane? That's what they do, kind of. But there are some disturbances. So let me quick sketch out two systems to show you kind of what the angular disturbances are. They're not going to be to scale, but they're just for reference. So let's say this is the Earth, and this is Or the, the rotation of the air. So anyway, 
Stretch's inclination. The moon, the natural satellite of the Earth, is at an, is at an inclination of five degrees. This is why we don't get those solar eclipses that often. Because usually this isn't even lined up with the, uh, uh, the solar orbital plane. And so then if you go down and look at the Earth's sun system, So, but the sun actually has an axis of rotation. And it takes roughly lined up with the plane of the solar system, but the Earth is actually 7.3 degrees inclined from the sun in its orbit. And then the Earth itself, of course, has a tilt of 23 degrees. Its axis of rotation is actually 23 degrees off from its orbital plane with the sun. And of course the moon is going to be plus or minus five, depending on where it is in the system from that. So it's going to kind of wobble around. Really, when things kind of line up perfectly to you, things like lunar eclipses and solar eclipses, which why you don't happen very often. Every month, every period of the moon. So these are the basic irregularities that affect our um, orbits or influence our orbital designs around the Earth. Now, I'd like to, to kind of conclude this section by talking about uh, a concept called orbital forcing. It's kind of a nice way to tie everything together to get with all the things that are going on in a complicated three-dimensional orbit. And it also turns out that it's a kind of interesting topic because it influences long-term climate change. So, I'm going to show you not just the man-made, but also some of the natural things that influence climate over time. So these all fall under the topic of orbital forcing that I'm going to talk about. We use a lot of these concepts. These are actually irregularities in the orbit of the Earth and of the Sun that causes some things that influence the climate of the planet. And I've highlighted four things just, just to show you. They're very similar to things that orbit around the Earth or satellite like orbits around any irregular uh, object. Now, of course, many of these perturbances are due to the presence of Jupiter. So if we're talking about an Earth-Sun system, the Sun is the biggest thing in the universe, and that's usually the culprit for disturbing other orbits. But if you're orbiting it around the Sun, Jupiter is the next biggest culprit, right? And so the presence of that heavy extra body introduces some irregularities into elliptical orbits that disturb the climate. And in fact, because these are quasi-periodic, there are certain climates in the long-term cycle of Earth. They're called Milankovic cycles. So uh, researchers have calculated these phenomena historically. And you tend to, when these different cycles tend to add constructively in a particular direction, you get very cold or very warm periods on the Earth. They're actually very good for predicting things like interglacial periods, times when the glaciers are receding or advancing long-term. These are usually operating on an uh, order of thousands and tens of thousands of years. So orbital forcing. There are three types of orbital forcing mechanisms. Accession variations in the orbit of the Earth. Precession variations. Obliquity variations. And inclination variations. So the test is three-dimensional conceptualization. Let's talk about each of these. How do they influence the climate of the Earth? Eccentricity. The Earth's orbit about the Sun over many, many cycles, thousands of cycles of years, will wobble between 0 0.005 and 0 0.05 inch. So we'll go to almost perfectly circular. And because of the presence of Jupiter, this third body is one of the disturbances in the universe, in the solar system, and possibly the universe, there will be some tugging, and it may stretch all the way to 0 0.058. It does not sound like that much, but it's still, you know, millions and millions of meters uh, of accumulated distance. They think it. Let's get to that. I'm going to exaggerate the eccentricity of any point here. The Earth is going to be on this elliptical path. Sometimes it's going to be per perfectly circular. And other times, it's going to be a little bit more eccentric. But the semi-major axis will be roughly the same. Remember, we're not really adding a lot of energy to the Earth. We're just kind of wobbling its eccentricity, stretching it a little one direction, tucking it up in another. It'll still take roughly one year to get around the, the sun. 
say the same same age or actions. So with the same average distance, would we expect any change in climate? It's a little brain teaser. <laughs> 